Hello, WellPod listeners. Brandon here. This is your heads up that this episode contains some strong language. If you'd prefer a beeped version of the show, just go onto our website, thewellpod.com, and click the show notes tab. You'll find it there. And away we go. You know, we kind of live our lives through this singular lens of this is what the world is like, this is how I've seen it my entire life, so why would I question it? And maybe I'm at more of a fault with that than most people. I, I don't know. Welcome to The Well. I am Brandon Edgens. And I am Anson Mount. Anson, we're going to start off with a softball question. Okay. And it's the central question of this episode. What is reality? <laughs> it's a simple yes or no question. I wish I had a simple answer for you, Brandon. Uh, <laughs> there isn't one. Clue. I started dealing with this <laughs> in freshman philosophy. I thought I was done with that with Swanee. <laughs> the, it was a bit of an ambush. There is no answer. Um, because, you know, it's uh, it's synthesized. Right. You know, in every individual's heads. And we all assume, naturally, and just to get through the day, you assume your reality is probably pretty similar to everybody else's. Sure. Mine is. That's how you can relate to other people. And you have to start somewhere. And you start with the assumption, your reality is probably a little like mine. Well, we start with the assumption that there is a reality other than ours, or we go straight into pure solipsism, which is the philosophy or the idea that there is no existence outside of my mind, because you can't prove anything else, which is just a black hole of philosophy. Right. But it also seems to be where babies start. (laughs) Yes, that is true. But some professors stay there. (laughs) (laughs) Believe me. <laughs> and also, some movie stars. Yes, 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 yes. It, it, it can infect, and the solipsism can infect anyone. But we, most normal people, mm-hmm. we all assume that reality is a shared experience. And our guest today, Melissa McCracken, assumed all of this too. Until one average day, she shared her thoughts with another person and found out she was actually living in a parallel reality. Wow. Okay. When I was about 15, um, I was trying to choose a ringtone for my phone. And um, I was really interested in making my ringtone match my phone. And so I had this navy blue phone, and I was interested in finding something that was kind of a warmer color to balance out the coolness of the phone. And um, this was a totally normal (laughs) endeavor to me. And so I was looking through my iTunes and I came across the song called Cheater by Michael Jackson. And um, I was listening to it and it was orange. And I was like, oh, this is perfect. Like, you know, these are complimentary colors. It's going to look great together. And so I leaned over to my friend that was next to me and I was like, hey, listen to this song. It it matches my phone. And he goes, you know, "What (laughs) what do you mean it matches? And I thought he didn't understand complimentary colors. And so I was like, oh, well, you know, it's blue or it's orange. And so that complements the blue. It's on the other side of the wheel, the color wheel. And then he was like, no, no, no. What do you mean the song is orange? And um, then I thought, I honestly thought something was wrong with him. And um, I was like, oh, my gosh, you can't you can't see this like you're you're missing something. Something's wrong. And so I started asking around and. um, was trying to kind of pick and prod everyone else's brains and asking if they were seeing color with music too. And yeah, I I honestly didn't hear anyone saying that they had seen it too. I think that was such a defining moment of my experience because I was so certain that, that something was off. I was like, you, you should be experiencing this. And my should was relative to me, (laughs) you know, I experience it. So you should also experience it. And it was so confusing that he that he didn't. It wasn't until I think a couple years later that I was in a psychology course, and uh, so my professor said, "Hey, does anyone in the room have 
synesthesia. And so I raise my hand and I look around and no one else has their hands up. So that at that moment, I was like, this is totally rare and weird. And now I am like the channel for this experience in a sense. You know, I'm the example of it throughout, I think, the rest of the class period. People were raising their hands and they're like, what does my name look like? And, you know, what is this song like? And so that's when it became fun. You know, synesthesia might have been like the genesis of my draw toward color, just because my world is so saturated in color that um, maybe that's just, you know, something that I automatically connect to and and want to um, express myself through visuals. But yeah, I didn't even start painting music until I think it was, I was 18 or 19. And that was the first time I ever painted a song. Melissa is a painter with synesthesia. And her beautiful paintings are inspired by what she sees when she listens to music. And for the rest of this episode to make sense, you may want to stop this episode now and go check out her paintings at melissasmccracken.com. We'll link to it on our website. Or simply Google her name. Now the first time I saw one of her paintings, which most people would call abstract, I was sure I was looking at a landscape of leaves floating down a river, And it took me a second to realize it wasn't representational, but it was beautiful, the way a natural landscape is beautiful. I love this artist's work. Mm. I really do. Because when you look at Melissa's paintings, you're looking at something that is abstract, but it doesn't feel that way because the work is so specific and and worked Mm -hmm. uh and then it makes sense later when you realize that she's she's painting painting something that 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 she sees so to her it's not abstract it's quite objective Mm -hmm. which is why you're you think you should be looking at something that you can tell what it is initially Mm -hmm. and you then then you realize that you can't exactly because what what is for you and I just an aural experience in mm-hmm. the ear is for her a visual experience with things that have texture and yeah. things that have shape and dimension. So when she's painting, it's um, you know, an interpretation of a physical experience. Oh, yeah. it is. She is having an experience of an internal landscape. Yeah, and that landscape is created by her synesthesia. So what is synesthesia anyway? Well, it's a pretty complicated and rare phenomena, so for now, we'll just stick with the Wikipedia definition, which states, Synesthesia is a perceptual phenomenon in which stimulation of one sensory or cognitive pathway leads to automatic, involuntary experiences in a second sensory or cognitive pathway. In other words, they can taste or see sounds or taste color. It's a disarrangement of the senses, and synesthetes often have more than just one kind of synesthesia. So I have three types of synesthesia. So one is the music to color synesthesia. Um, I also have grapheme synesthesia, which um, is, uh, I see letters and numbers as specific colors. You know, every A is blue and every B is brown, and that's very, very consistent. And then I also have spatial sequential synesthesia, synesthesia. So anything that comes in any sort of sequence has a set point in space around my body. So if I'm counting, I'll map from kind of the the lower front part of myself, um, kind of by my thighs, and like 100 will be closer to my ear. I to my so it'll start from you know my left thigh up to my right ear. Um, and so if I reference numbers or the days of the week or something like that, it's always in a set point in space. So I know if I'm going to meet you on Monday, it'll be in a specific point around my body. It is completely involuntary and completely automatic. Um, I mean, even my memories of music are more so in color than the music itself, Mm -hmm. which is frustrating at times because, you know, if I have something stuck in my head or I remember like, oh, I loved this song and it was purple and orange, and I that that is a dead end completely for anyone else understanding what I'm going oh, through. Now I'm sad because so. <laughs> I so realized I never alone. thought I never <laughs> thought of it from the other perspective where it was be sort of isolating to yeah. to be like, don't you love the color of that song? And everyone's like, hmm. not that it's isolate. I mean, even other synesthetes 
experience, it's completely subject subjective to them too. And so, uh, you know, we might compare our, our colors for a certain song and it's going to be different based on each synesthete that interacts with it. I guess to the rest of the world or to someone looking in on my experience, it's 100% arbitrary, you know? I guess your subjective experience is objective to your own inner world. <laughs> so then that's kind of however you want to put that, I guess. <laughs> Maybe this isn't going to make sense by the end of this entire interview, but... <laughs> Whenever you start dealing with perception, you go down this yeah, rabbit hole. totally. Right? You know, it's, it becomes... It, it's suddenly the, the limits of language and everything just, yeah. like, comes crashing down on yep. you. Yep. <laughs> 100%. Words just fail over and over because words don't work very well, right, to describe our experiences. And this actually is a more common problem in our daily lives, for example... How do you describe a song to someone? You know, you can you can hum Beethoven's Eighth to someone, and you may be able to hear it in your head, but that other person is locked out of your experience. And even those amongst us who dedicate their lives to film or music criticism struggle to translate an experience intended for one medium into the language of another. I'd heard this quote for for decades but just research the origin is actually Martin Mull writing about music is like dancing about architecture <laughs> <laughs> that's perfect <laughs> nail on the head <laughs> so I'm going to ask you to dance about architecture uh-huh. uh huh so I did that thing where I played a piece of music for Melissa and then asked her to describe what she heard visually <laughs> now I don't have the rights to this piece of music, so I recorded a rough sound-alike track to play under our discussion. So for while you're listening to her describe the track, uh, what you're listening to is not the song. It's, it's me doing a, a, a terrible interpretation of it. Uh, but later on, go to our webpage. We'll put it in the show notes. The song is called Cold by the band The Cure. <laughs> it's a very dark song. I wasn't really in that dark a state of mind when I was that week. I just it was just on my mind. And because like she said because it was I was feeling it deeply personally. I was really interested in what she heard and what she saw. I'm going to guess it's a very purple <gasps> yes song yeah um dark purple <laughs> yeah well know. you got that's, da, you da, da, da. that's yeah. all I got <laughs> so that like bass or stand up bass that was like this jagged Z kind of shape so that's, I feel like I'm channeling something right now for well, you. What color? <laughs> what color that, is oh, uh, it was like a, um, like a chestnutty kind of orangish brownish uh, with, with purple undertones. So that kind of set that, the stage for it to be kind of a purpley song. Center right was more of like a sage greeny kind of color of those chords whatever that was going on and then his voice on top of it um, was more of rounded rectangular Mm -hmm. Uh (laughs) going through the center um, and that was a a darker green and I don't know because his voice is so I don't want to say flat in like a technical music term, mm-hmm. but it's it's more of a monotone sort of voice, which I think makes it more horizontally rectangular. He curves out all of his syllables and sounds. They're, they, they don't end in a dissonant sort of way. Um, so I think that's what makes it rounded. That there was like the dropping icicle sound. It was like light blue and circular, but but dropping, trickling, and kind of bouncing. And the whatever string, deep string bass sound that was, 
Um, all of those kind of have this jagged look to it in itself. It's like if I drew the Z uh. and then put little notches throughout the entire Z line. I have noticed that um, songs can be more uh, foreground oriented or background or oh. mid. Um, and this one would be more mid to back. Like there was nothing that was directly like, uh-huh. you know how some vocals can be like so c- crystal clear and so high and so yeah. in your face. And I feel like that it literally is in my face, mm-hmm. you know. Um, and this one didn't necessarily have any components that um, that alluded to something being super close up. The, the green, the is that the sort of medium to high range scent that almost sounds mm-hmm. like a string kind of, kind of comes in about yeah. eight mm-hmm. measures? In. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. See, and that's the thing about synesthesia. I, it makes sense to people, you know? Like, I feel like you're obviously connecting with those associations. Mm-hmm. Right. So, may, I mean, it's, back to your point of maybe it is something that we're just re, you know, uncovering. It's something I think that is... Uh, subconscious to most people Mm -hmm. and that you have conscious access oh maybe that is it I think I'm starting to see into a little bit of what Melissa is hearing that the backgrounded quality is probably her response to the reverb right Mm -hmm. it's a very reverby echoey recording which we associate with distance Mm mm-hmm uh, but I, 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 I love these conversations because they force us to get more intimate with our fellow human beings. Right. You know, it forces us to drop our assumptions that our default self-centered point of view is better or more correct. These are all. Well, that's the whole point of art. Yeah. Right. It's to see what, what, what are you seeing? Yeah. 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 You know, yeah. like, and then, and then someone, you know, you, you sick. 20 different painters on a scene and it's never the you same. You get 20 different scenes. You yeah. get 20 different scenes. You get 20 different... Well, what was your experience of that song? So we can bring in a third. I, 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 I anticipated this question and so I spent some time trying to see what I would paint and I just don't have that. Oh. That particular thing. But in, in, in fact, I, I will, if it's worth anything, I saw pure I, ivories. <laughs> <laughs> ivories and gold streaks but but huh. i may have just might as i may have been making that up i don't know because <laughs> cause the pressure was on man <laughs> well, you, you saw ivories yeah well that's but, wrong <laughs> <laughs> where does this color happen oh yeah okay so yeah people have asked if i can drive and listen to music right. because it i think a lot of people automatically think that it just hinders my my sight which it doesn't The best way that I can describe it is that if you're thinking of a memory, wherever that memory lies, I mean, my synesthesia lies where my memories lie. So if yours lie in the same area, (laughs) then it would just be kind of this um, translucent sort of filter um, that covers all of all of my visual span, I guess, Um, more so maybe directed higher rather than lower. So there's more of a clarity in the center, I would say, unless there's like a very obvious um, instrument or or voice or something like that. I would feel, I feel like voices kind of take center. So at the risk of forcing Melissa to dance about architecture, I asked her to translate the experience of listening to music, but this time with words. Yet another layer of translation. But we did our best, folks. Like, <laughs> I'm trying to get folksy. <laughs> but we did our best, folks. Like all art, there needs to be a space created first, a prepared field where the work can then take place. Like, if I clear my mind, it's all navy blue. Like, it just feels like outer space. I think a lot of context for music is maybe in a darker space where it's like you're at a concert and the whole hall is dark and then you have light that comes into it. Um, but then there's like sunshiny music, you know, where, and I feel like a lot of that has lighter tones to it when it's happier and it's more of a daytime thing. And I don't know where the beginning of it all is, but 
<laughs> right, why not white? Because people would think of that as Yeah, and white I think black, some people you know? do. After one talk that I did, me and a group of people sat down after it, and we just all talked about what our blank mind looked like. And everyone had a different thing, which was never a conversation that we've ever thought to bring up. Well, it's not a conversation that anyone has ever <laughs> heard having. What does your blank mind look like? Well, I mean, but that's the thing is that we all have it. We've just all never talked about it. It's the same thing as people being like, I wonder if your orange looks like my orange or whatever. But we know that it's orange. And it's the same with your blank mind. It's like, okay, clear your mind. And we all do it. But I don't think we really try to consider what it would look like and for me it's generally navy blue and for a lot of people it was white some people it was a scene it was like they're sitting at a beach some people it was white but they had like a you know kind of a horizontal line going through the the whole thing kind of being like the the horizon it was different for every person, you know, or maybe like an off-white color, a salmon-y color, or something like that. There is a lot of sifting through things to get to where I want to get with the painting, and that ends up being a lot of different paintings that I, you know, start to 95% finish and then decide this isn't, this isn't the vibe (laughs) that I really feel fits that song and then I start over again and go at it from a different angle. I guess the the best way that I feel like I can describe it is by looking at a movie poster for a movie. It's you're trying to figure out all the elements that are most important and kind of most um, representative of of what that movie is going to be or or what experience you're going to get whenever you watch that movie and so it's like I'm creating a poster for a song (laughs) in a sense and so there can be elements of the song that um, exist that I do away with because it it's not this overarching theme Um, or there might be really tiny beautiful moments that I decide to really latch on to because I feel like that's the part of the song that is kind of a crux for it for me so it's interesting because there is so much choosing involved in the process. Um, you're, you're choosing either two dimensions or you're choosing time <laughs> because music is going through time. And so it's, it's choosing the moments, too, that have the most momentum in them, you know. And, um, and that's kind of why I incorporate a lot of, like, splatters or drips or something like that because I feel like that gets that intention across of... Of, of movement and I think movement is really important when you know mm. representing something that goes through time I couldn't help but notice looking at your paintings there must be spatial mm-hmm. spatial sequence mm-hmm. is that what it is plays a part I've never thought about that really but I wonder oh my gosh maybe <laughs> that's funny I mean I really do think that with art in any realm is you do what you do and then you can kind of dissect it later you know it's like so much of it is intuitive and you don't really know why you're doing it but it it makes sense as you're doing it but I've never thought about that but yeah (laughs) I think that they do exist in certain points in space Mm -hmm. around me you know and it's and it's just another example of taking something that is more three-dimensional than I've even considered and putting it on this flat 2D frame. You know, looking at the Edda James, I think. Mm-hmm. And I was looking at the movement. And I was looking at the way things were laid out, not just according to tone, but to but to a spatial relationship uh-huh. where the pianos exist on one side. It's a horizontal orientation, and there's there's the mass of it is towards the right. It's blue, mm-hmm. and then there's like gold tones and things like that. And um, yeah, her she. It, it projects from the right to the left, which I had never really considered. That's just how I translated it when I did it, I guess. Um, but that is interesting. I've never thought about how that's an, another element. I immediately experienced it as something representational. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> Until I was like, oh, this leaves on a floating a river. And wait, no, it's uh-huh. not leaves on a river. But I kept turning it thinking I would find... Sure. The, the, trying to make it resolve itself into something mm-hmm. familiar. That's at least how, how I'll experience yeah. it. I'm sure you've heard that before, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. 
Uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that that is the pursuit throughout the entire thing. And it's kind of shifted, I would say, from the beginning when I first started painting music. It was super, super, like almost like a mapping of... Um, of what I was experiencing. It was like, okay, this bass note is deep purple and it's, you know, lower in the frame than the guitar, which is golden, you know? So I, I would directly try to map those things out. Um, but then the further that I got into it, it, I guess it became more abstracted in a sense. Um, it became more of my personal relationship to the music I was listening to and kind of what the pursuit was of the musical artists themselves and the emotions that they were going through. And so then it became a little more of a cohesive effort. Um, There's so much coming together that I feel like directly mapping it, just I didn't care anymore. It was like, I don't think that it's really about, you know, saying, oh, this piano chord is, you know, light green and yellow. That's not the pursuit. The pursuit is to express something. And so I wanted to kind of kind of lean more into that avenue of um of expression rather than just pure representation so it's kind of become a mix of everything because of course what I do experience as a synesthete initially informs the entire thing um that's that's where the whole the whole picture pops up I think that I describe it to people as being abstract expressionism be um just because I think that's the most identifiable you know, source of you communication it for it. Yeah. yeah. And so I think that that kind of pings up something in everyone's brains to be like, okay, that's what that is. Um, and it, it is representational. Um, it's very representational. And then there is that kind of abstracted area to it too. What I learned from this interview is that I, I had thought uh, that her paintings contained the timeline of the song. I thought I was looking mm. at a linear representation of the song mm-hmm. through her paintings. And for her to say, I paint the poster, the movie poster mm-hmm. of the song, so I'm choosing the elements to represent the song, I was like, oh, wow, you are having a much bigger experience than I thought you were having. Well, yeah, but at the same time, I related to that differently because it sounded like what we all say about any what our favorite song is, you know, like, mm-hmm. I like the part where he goes, woo, I like the right. part where the, car, where the guitar goes, you know, like, yeah, yeah. but yet we have this assumption that everyone is having an experience that's not too far away from the one I'm having. So, you know, we talk about the truth, you know, as being relative uh, as a philosophical issue, which you, she's reminded every single day in all moments that like, oh no, that philosophical thing that you and I can pick up and put down as we please. No. Right. right, Like that's, that's her 24 (laughs) seven. And do you feel like, uh, being a synesthete has sort of granted you a certain wisdom in that regard. Um, I don't. I I don't know if it's wisdom so much as just an opportunity. It kind of opened up my eyes to thinking. All right, so I see this differently. That means other people are seeing you know the world differently or having different perspectives or you know just their senses, just their biological senses might be completely different. So um, that kind of made me look at that uh, more and <laughs> just more frequently um, and consider it whenever I'm making decisions, consider it when I'm talking to someone, you know, consider it whenever someone comes into a project with a different viewpoint or a different solution or, or whatever it may be um, and noticing that there's obviously not one direct path to any sort of end. It's such an object lesson in the way the thing that you were forced to contend with, which is a philosophical question, you know, do we all just live in our own realities? Mm-hmm. And you know, mm-hmm. yes. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> you guys will soon understand. No, it's just, it's just different. <laughs> Imagining living with a condition, not a condition, but a, it's certainly not as, as, as difficult probably as being somebody who's blind or even being a, a racial minority, but to be forced to remind yourself that, not not that there's no re- objective reality, but that there are different conditions for different people 
of that reality that that maybe you need to consider. Mm-hmm. I think one of the first things that for me echoed through all of this is one of the very first things that she said on her story about how she may not have known or would have come to this self realization about herself mm-hmm. much later if she hadn't try to put it into words and communicate it to somebody else. Yes. That story about the, the flip phone being and the song being orange and the phone being blue. Right. And the, it's, uh, it was it kind of, for me, it was a kind of a pretty heavy reminder in a way that like how important communication is. We all make assumptions about our reality and about other people's realities, you know, assuming that they're probably like ours and if they disagree with us and, but they live in our paradigm, so they must be really, really wrong <laughs> to not see things the way that we do. And she went through a brief moment of that. I'm like, what do you mean you don't see that this song is orange? <laughs> what's, right. what's wrong with you? <laughs> right. Yes. That's very human. Right. It's very human. And then, but it really, throughout all this, it really drove home uh, this point. And, you know, you and I have known each other for a very long time. You know that if you spend more than five or six hours with me, I'm going to trot out this quote. (laughs) And it's my favorite quote from one of my favorite popularizers of science and history, James Burke, at the conclusion of his epic 10-hour The Day the Universe Changed, favorite 10 hours of television ever. The whole thing is about how consciousness changes how reality changes based on new discovery you make an assumption this is what science does i think reality is this and then you invent a new tool you have a new observation and suddenly you got to go back to the drawing board and you got to do it again and do it again and do it again and do it again but the point is there would be no shared experience of reality if we didn't talk about it you know if melissa didn't paint we have no we would have no idea what was going on in that very special singular sort of reality that she lives in and here's the quote from James Burke if as i have said all along the universe is at any time what you say it is then say it because that is the moment where we can all at least Uh, you know get in the square and agree with each other or debate what it is but you've got to say it first Mm -hmm. or we make the horrible sometimes deadly mistake of assuming but if you talk you find out you have a lot more in common you just you're all interpreting the same sensory input differently Mm -hmm. but no one's wrong you know and you and i can talk about a song that's fun and it's interesting but what happens if someone comes to you and says oh I've seen your favorite song you know you <laughs> would you want to know what that looks like you know like and, and here's the funny thing there's no way to judge it either yeah, yeah <laughs> you right. can't say because if you're asking her to to interpret it all you can do is accept it and then try to understand by looking at the painting what she must have been seeing and hearing and then now you were re-experiencing that song again for the first time. Yes, yeah, and that's so. What's what's so part of what's so wonderful about looking at her paintings mm-hmm. is wanting to see that song again through her eyes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. The Well is produced, edited, and recorded by Anson Mount and Brandon Edgens. Special thanks to Melissa McCracken for sitting down with me and answering the question she's been asked a million times already, what's it like being you? You should go check out her work at melissasmccracken.com where you can commission her for an original painting based on your favorite song. How cool is that? Theme music by Jonathan Myberg. Additional music for this episode by Brandon Edgens based on compositions by The Cure. To hear the original recording referenced in this episode, please go to the show notes section of our webpage, thewellpod.com, and while you are there, please subscribe to our newsletter. And after you've done that, please consider writing us a review on iTunes or Stitcher, 
or wherever you get your podcasts. It really helps us out. Thank you and have a great week. That was called The Reliquary of Antioch. Why? I don't know. That sounds like a lot of me.